Good morning and welcome to South Point Church Online. We want to welcome those in our Southern Maryland community. We also want to say hi to those of you who might be watching in different parts of the country or maybe even anywhere around the world. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point. And on behalf of our amazing volunteers and our staff, we want to say thanks so much for joining us this Sunday morning. Hey, we're in week three of a series about faith fear. And then the question mark means, what does that even mean? In this season, you and I have been seeing and hearing more than ever about these two words, faith and fear. I mean, you see it on Facebook, you see it on Instagram, you'll see it on YouTube. Now in this unprecedented season where nothing is normal, it becomes even more important for you and for me and for we to navigate those two words, faith and fear, in a way that is wise, is healthy, and is trustworthy. Now, in weeks one and in weeks two, we discovered a simple truth about faith. And I'm going to put it up on the screen for us this morning. And it's this. Faith is relational, not circumstantial. You see, we've said each of the last two weeks, faith is never about the what around us, right? It's never about the what that happens to us. Faith is about who we put our trust, our confidence, and our hope in. Matter of fact, we've made a little statement out of it. It goes something like this. Listen, faith isn't a pass from pain or problems. Faith protects our purpose, that you and I were meant to be children of God. Now this week, we want to tackle the word fear. And the reason that we want to tackle the word fear is because fear matters to us all. Listen, regardless of whether you have no faith, whether you have different faith, or whether you grew up as a follower of Jesus, each and every single one of us will have the feeling of fear. Feeling of fear is not an if question, it is a when question. And so we want to tackle that today. That's why it's so important. Now, before I dive in, when it talk, talking about fear, I want to make sure that you understand that I am not talking about the mental health issues of depression, anxiety, or panic, okay? You see, our brain can get injured just like any other organ in our body, like the heart or lungs. And so if you're seeing a professional or under doctor's directions taking medicine, it is not a lack of faith. It is simply the truth that you and I live in a busted and broken world. The fear that I'm talking about is the everyday type of fear that all of us will experience regardless of of our faith. Now, listen, in my own journey of dealing with fear and have working with people for almost 30 years, I discovered that fear has three main pieces that are almost always associated that when you and I experience the feeling of fear, and I'm going to put them up on the screen for us, and it's this. Fear will make us feel alone. When you experience fear, when I experience fear, we often feel like we're going through it alone. Nobody understands. It'll only happen to me that somehow our fear will apply only to us. Fear also makes us feel like life is undone. Whatever the brokenness is, whatever the hurt, whatever the disappointment is, that it will be complete and total. It won't be partial. It won't be halfway. This fear often drives us to believe that our lives will be undone. And lastly, fear means that we believe that it will be permanent, that this thing that happens to us, it can't be undone and it will last the rest of our lives life. And here's what I discovered about fear. Fear often leads to the very behaviors and things we hate in life. I, I made a list of things fear drives me to and might have drove you to. And I bet we've seen fear drive other people to these things. Fear drives people to be greedy. I mean, if this pandemic hasn't taught us anything, it's that fear can drive good, normal human beings to be greedy. Fear can drive us to be selfish, where it's all about me, myself, and I, and we forget to love our neighbor. Fear can cause us to hate. I can't tell you in conversations when we don't know who or what people are like, we will fear the unknown. Fear will cause us to lie. Sometimes the truth is just the best way, but in fear, we'll lie. Fear will lead to cheating, either because we can't win or succeed or need that job. We'll take shortcuts. We'll cheat because we fear the outcome. Fear will also lead to procrastination. We'll continue to put something off because we believe it'll be painful or hard, but it never actually solves the problem. And as we look at the list of things that fear drives me to, 
too. It probably drives you too. We look at that list and say, fear usually doesn't drive us to anything that is good. Fear almost always drives us to broken behavior. And it leads you and I to a truth that all of us have experienced in life. And it's our opening truth this morning we're gonna put up here. Fearful decisions are often unwise decisions. When we make decisions in fear, they're usually bad ones. Matter of fact, this isn't my idea. This isn't my opinion. Did you know scientific research proves that in a fearful state, fear often circumvents the thinking part of our brain and we make poor or bad decisions based on fear. And here's the problem with fearful decisions that are often unwise decisions. I mean, think about this. When we're fearful or terrified, do you think we make good decisions? I discovered there are three parts of usually fearful decisions. First, they are rushed. We, we feel fear drives us that we need to make a decision right now, so we rush the decision. Often fear makes a rash decision, and fear often drives us to rationalize behavior that in any other circumstance, you and I, we would know that that isn't the right thing to do. Matter of fact, did you know science and research backs this up? Do you know one of the way that marketers and sellers sell you and I things? They use what's called the fear factor that we're going to miss out. So they want us to rush to buy things because they have limited quantities. You see, fear will cause us to rush. Fear will cause us to have rash behaviors. Again, fear circumvents our logic. And sometimes in a rash decision of fear, we just make a really bad decision. And then we'll rationalize. I bet you've done this. I know I've done this. Fear, whether it's actually scary fear or the fear of missing out, right? We rationalize behavior that in any other circumstances, you and I know wouldn't be the right thing. And you know what? I've experienced this in my life. As a matter of fact, true story. Uh, number one, I was 12 years old. Now, I was 12 years old. I was living with my biological dad and my stepmom, right? And they had gone out for the evening. Um, I can't remember why they went out. I don't know if they were on a date night. I don't know if they were going to a party. Uh, but I know that I was home alone, and it was the evening. And I think I was supposed to stay inside, but I, I don't really remember. But I remember I had a friend who had called me on a landline. I don't know if you remember what that is, but that does date me, right? I had a good friend call me on a landline and said that his dad got this new thing called cable, which also dates me, and said there's a channel that we definitely shouldn't have been watching that his dad had. So I ran over to his house. We watched a channel that we shouldn't have had. And I lost track of time. And so I ran home. And as I was coming home to my little townhouse with my biological dad and my stepmom, I noticed all the lights were on. I could see the dog was out. And I noticed that my, my uh, biological dad and my stepmom were home. And all of a sudden, in fear, I made a really unwise decision. It was rust. It was ra rash. And then I eventually rationalized. I said, oh my gosh, I wonder if they know what I did. I don't think I was supposed to be out. They're going to put me on permanent punishment. I'm going to get a spanking. Life is over. And so you know what I did? As a 12-year-old crazy kid, I ran away for almost two weeks. And when I ran away, I was cold. I was hungry. I slept in a sewer. I stole people's tips. I rationalized that stealing was okay because I was hungry. I stole food from stores. And get this, I broke into a church and ate communion wafers and drank the juice that they used for communion. And I broke into cars. I mean, I did all those things. And then finally, when I got caught and was brought back home, my parents, my biological dad and my stepmom were so confused. They're like, why did you run away? We thought you went on a walk. Because fearful decisions are often unwise decisions. And it leaves you and I asking, have you ever made an unwise or bad decision because of fear? I mean, not just the scary kind of fear, but the fear of missing out. I mean, did the fear of missing out on him or her cause you to make an unwise decision? Did missing out on that thing or that person cause you to make an unwise financial decision? Did your fear of missing out on landing that contract or that job or that thing cause you to make an unwise or bad decision? I bet if we were honest, when we look back at our bad decisions, many of them were made because we feared that we were going to miss out or we were fearful. And so it leaves you and I asking a really important question today. How do you, how do I, how do we not let fear drive us to bad decisions?
So here's my hope for us together today is that you and I together will look at three observations that may help us avoid making decisions in fear so we don't experience the consequences of bad or unwise decisions. Now, the first observation I wanna make is one that you already know. So when I show it to you, don't freak out, don't go, ah, Matt, I already know it. But it's so important that we actually have to address it. And so I wanna make sure that you know about it. And so this is the first observation that will help us this morning. And again, you already know it, but we're gonna put it up on the screen. Fear can become an unhealthy mindset. You already know this, I already know this. If we regularly have a response, it will lead to it being a reflex. Listen, our regular responses often become reflexes. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about when it comes to like the same fear that we're talking about, right? And I'm gonna put up on the screen it's something like this. We feel the fear, feeling of fear, right? Like, you know, fear isn't, you know, it's something that we feel, so we feel fear. But none of us likes the feeling of fear, right? Unless you're like watching a horror movie or like bungee jumping, right? But most of us don't like the feeling of fear. And so when we feel the feeling of fear, we start what I call the blame game. And here's why. Because none of us wants to feel fear. Like we wouldn't choose that right? So it's got to be somebody's fault. I mean, anybody's fault other than ours. It's got to be our pastor's fault. It's got to be the government's fault. It's our kids, our spouse, our neighbors. It's anybody's fault than ours. But here's what I discovered. When fear causes us to play the blame game, we often become passive or aggressive in our behavior, whether it's sarcasm or striking out, we begin to play the blame game, which is a game, listen, that none of us win, right? But the blame game leads into what I call the worst case scenario, right? We, we have this feeling of fear. We start to blame God. We blame others. We blame our government. We blame our neighbors. We blame, our, we blame everyone but us, right? And then we start to imagine the worst case scenario. I'm going to lose my job. When I lose my job, I won't have any money. When I don't have any money, I'm going to lose my car and my home. And my wife's going to leave me and my kids won't be good. And the world will come to an end. And we be, begin to believe the worst case scenario, which then leads to what? More feelings of fear, which leads to more blame, to worst case. And then often you and I can get stuck in an unhealthy mindset. You see, the feeling of fear becomes a mindset that is unhealthy. And you know what? You see this in life all the time. Think about all the successful people in different endeavors that you like. Maybe it's a successful athlete. Maybe it's a successful nurse or doctor or someone who has success in like aviation or as a first responder, like a firefighter or a, a police officer. Anybody that has success, you know this to be true. They usually become successful because they practice something over and over. So listen, that the right response becomes a reflex. I mean, come on, think about it. What does a boxer do? A boxer regularly practices boxing with someone so that their response isn't just something they have to think about. It becomes a reflex that they do. Did you know that neuroscience tells us that if we have the same thoughts over and over, it creates a new neural pathway that becomes a shortcut or a highway. And so I wonder if we regularly have the response of fear, we begin to create a pathway in our mind that circumvents logic and all of a sudden our natural regular response of fear now becomes a reflex. True story number two for those of you counting. Uh, I had a good friend who attends South Point Church. Um, during a time when my daughter was younger, she used to take Taekwondo. And so I took it with her so that we could have something that we did together. And my friend who attends our church showed up and he had a test the next day and they had this section of sparring and, and he and I were sparring. And before we started sparring, he said this to me, he said, now, Matt, listen, I have this big test tomorrow. You know, I just want to work on a few things. Please, please don't go hard. Like, don't mess me up. Like, let's just have a little bit of fun. Let's get some work in. And that'll be great. I said, great. I got you. I totally understand. Right. So we got in our stances. Right. And then he like rushed at me. And before I could think about it, my reflex from growing up was a straight left jab. Whap. And I punched him right in the nose. And he like went, grabbed his face because you weren't allowed to punch in the face. Right. He grabbed his nose and was like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm so sorry. It was a, and if you want to type this in, if you're following on the chat, type in reflex. You see, our regular responses end up becoming reflexes. If our regular response is fear, eventually it becomes an unhealthy mindset that is a reflex that just happens anytime 
we have a feeling. Now, here's the great news. God knew that humanity would struggle with this reflex of fear, of an unhealthy mindset. There was this guy, his name was Paul. He used to actually persecute Christians, right? But then he encountered a risen Jesus. And then he was writing uh, to the church about this. And he knew that fear would be something that everyone would struggle with. And I like what he writes. And we're gonna put it up on the screen. He writes this, he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, Did you catch that? God hasn't given you and I a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and of love and of self-discipline. I mean, this one sentence is so powerful. First of all, it tells you and I this truth, that when you and I say yes to Jesus, God gives you and I as a gift, his presence, the Holy Spirit. Now, God's a gentleman. He's not gonna possess you. He comes along as a partner, right? But he gives us his presence to come live inside of us. And when his presence comes and lives, inside of us, it gives us power. It gives us love. And we're gonna come back to that love thing a little bit later in the message, but that's really important. And self-discipline. And here's why the self-discipline is important. If you and I don't do something about the feeling of fear, if we don't discipline and create some habits, then all of a sudden we fall into an unhealthy mindset. So when we have the feeling of fear, we have to practice self-discipline so it doesn't become a reflex. Now, just like I said, observation number one would be something that you already know. Now, observation number two for me was painful and it's something that we often miss. Matter of fact, uh, as I was writing this message, it's something that I've been struggling with of going, how do I miss this so often in my own life? Um, And this isn't my observation. This is a truth that Jesus tells us, uh, which leads us to observation number two that we often miss. We often fear the wrong things. And this isn't my idea. Like, listen, we often fear the wrong things, right? Like we often fear that we're gonna miss out on a promotion. We often fear that we're not gonna get the car that we want. We often fear that we're not gonna have the right kind of kids or that we're not married the right kind of person. We we often fear things that usually have to do with pleasure, comfort, and convenience. And it's amazing that Jesus knew that we would struggle with this. And Jesus tells you, he tells me, he tells us that we often are scared or fearful of the very wrong things. Matter of fact, in the eyewitness account of the gospel of Matthew, it records Jesus' own words. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you. So Jesus is speaking to the crowd. He says, listen, I just want you to know something. He says, do not worry. Do not be afraid. Do not fear about your life what you will eat, drink, or about your body. He's saying, listen, the whole world has always struggled about the clothes they wear, how much food they have, what kind of house they live, what kind of car. They didn't have cars back then, but you know what I'm talking about, what kind of horses or chariots. Like we're always concerned about our comfort, our convenience, our pleasure, the things that we have. And then he asked this question, is life not more than food? And Jesus is driving home a point that is so important. He's saying, listen, don't you get it? Life is more than what we consume. Life is meant to be more than our comforts or convenience. And he says, and the body is more than clothes. He says, don't you get it? You guys often fear the comfort and convenience and the pleasures, but what about your purpose? What about the very thing that you were made to do? And it left me with this question. I often fear on missing out on comfort, convenience, and pleasure. Rarely do I ask myself the question, am I missing out on my purpose? I really struggled with this truth this week as I was thinking about my life. Because if I'm really honest with you today, when I go to bed and I am kind of frustrated with my day or I'm thinking about what went wrong or I'm thinking about my regrets, do you know what my regrets, my frustrations, the things that I'm upset about that keep me up? It's usually like my food wasn't cooked right. I didn't get what I want when I ordered. Uh, There was a problem at work and so I had to to solve it and it created pain. Um, I didn't get to have as much fun as I was hoping. My show got canceled. Like if I'm really honest, when I get to the end of the day and the things that frustrate me, the things that I regret usually have to do with comfort, convenience, and pleasure. Rarely have I gone to bed and said, hey, God, was there somebody that you put in my life that I missed today that I was supposed to love on your behalf? God, did I use today the way that you wanted me to? It was a gift. Did I use it in a way to make the world a better place? And see, Jesus tells us that we often fear the wrong thing. You see, we often fear the things that we're not gonna get instead of, are we accomplishing the purpose as sons and daughters of God? I mean, comfort and convenience, those are gifts. Pleasure, it's a gift. But that's not what life is about. Life is more than consumption. 
And often so much of our time and attention is given to are we missing out on comfort and convenience and not asking, are we missing our purpose? As I was preparing this, there was this phrase that came to my mind and it's this. And sometimes there are truths about life that we don't like, but just because we don't like them doesn't change the truth. And here's what I discovered and you know, but we don't like to say out loud. Purpose always has a price. Purpose always comes with a price. I saw a little quote this week that was going right along. It said, calling and comfort do not go hand in hand. And so I wanna ask the question today, are you and I fearing the wrong things? Is what we fear missing out on our comfort, our conveniences, our pleasure? Do we ask ourselves on a daily, <coughs> sorry, and on a regular basis, are we missing out on our purpose? And now observation number three, observation number one is something you already knew. Observation number, number uh, two was something we missed. Now observation number three might actually be shocking. And, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen and it's this right here. Fear's opposite is love. You see, I think so often, both in the world and in Christianity, we often assume that fear's opposite is faith. But if you really, like, come on, think about it. Fear is a feeling and faith is a response. So they can't be opposites because they're two different things, right? What if fear's opposite is love. And what if this truth isn't really even my idea or my thought, but actually comes from the Bible? This same guy, Paul, right? He's writing another Christian and he has this letter and we're gonna put it up on the screen here. It's actually 1 John, it isn't Paul, but he says this, such love has no, what's that word? So maybe you wanna type in the chat, no fear. You see, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for the fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. If you and I could be really honest today, when we experience pain, when we experience suffering, when we experience problems, you know what most of our third, th first thoughts are? God's angry at us. God's punishing us. Why doesn't God love me? Why doesn't God give me a pass? If we're really honest, the things that we fear are that we fear that God isn't for us. And here's what the author is trying to tell you and I. He says, don't you get it? Any God that would die for you is for you. God can't love you any more in Christ Jesus than he already does. And if you knew how much God loved you, you wouldn't have fear. You would have joy and peace and hope. Not not that you would never experience the feeling of fear, but fear would never become a mindset because you have the mindset of love. The verse I was saying about the Apostle Paul comes um, in Timothy and we're gonna put up here on the screen and it says this. So you have not received a spirit, again, God's presence to come live inside of us. So you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. You see, the reality is, is that when you and I don't have faith in a creator, circumstances become our God. And we become slaves to our circumstances. And if you and I are slaves to our circumstances, then we should absolutely be fearful because we have no control over many of our circumstances. And see, this is the truth and the good news of Jesus is that we are set free. We are no longer fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's spirit that when comes and lives inside of you, when he adopted you as his own, what's that word? Children. And now we call him Abba, Father. You know, I started back in the beginning of this message about what fear causes us to feel. But love has an answer to those things. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen and it looks something like this. Remember I said, fear makes us feel alone. Like we're all by ourselves. No one understands. No one's gonna come support me. I'm gonna have to go through this alone. It is gonna be totally and completely broken. Not partially, not halfway, but totally and completely. And it'll be permanent. And here's the amazing good news of Jesus. You see, the empty tomb is a promise. The gift of God's spirit living inside of us is a commitment, is a sign that you and I can know that love means God is present with us no matter what we're going through. And listen, faith never promises you and I a pass from pain. If anyone tells you, you get a pass from pain, they are lying. Jesus says, in this world, you have trouble. But he says, listen, love means I will be present with you through the storms. It says, you will not be undone. You can be secure that however broken it is, the empty tomb reminds us that it won't be broken. And listen, it won't be permanent. Whatever it is that we're facing someday, God will make it all right. Love means God is present, that it is secure, that redemption is coming. Redemption can happen 
in part now, ask me how I know I've experienced it. But there is a day where there'll be full redemption and it is secure. And whatever pain or brokenness, it will not be permanent. It's temporary because someday God is going to come and he's going to make all things right. And so this is what the cycle of love looks like. We're going to put it up on the screen right here. You see, when we feel God's love, then we have faith. And remember, faith is response. Faith is not a feeling. If you go back to the first two weeks, faith isn't a feeling. Faith is a decision. And I'm going to say something really hard, but it's so true. And it's just so simple. You know what faith is? Faith is regardless of what I see and how I feel, I'm going to choose the right thing that honors God and loves others. You see, love says, I know that God is good. I know that God loves me. I know he is for me. So regardless of how I feel, regardless of what I see, I can choose to do the next right thing no matter what, no matter how I feel and no matter what I see. And when we have faith to do that, then we expect that God will show up and do what only he can do. And I am telling you, in my life and the life of many people who follow Jesus, I haven't gotten everything I've wanted. I haven't gotten a Passed from pain, but I have expected God and God has showed up and done things that only God can do. And when that happens, I love God more, which strengthens my faith. And then I expect God, then God shows up. And then I am not in an unhealthy mindset of fear. I am in a mindset of love. I want to tell a uh, true story, a uh, number four, I think it is, uh, kind of about what I mean about love. Because love is meant to be an anchor or a compass that steers us when we are blinded by fear. We live here in Southern Maryland in a community that is supported by a naval naval air base, right? And I've had several friends that are pilots. Matter of fact, my adopted dad, he got his pilot's license. Um, and if you know anything about pilots, there's two kind of class of pilots. One is what you call VFR, which means visual flight rules. And so when you're kind of a rookie or new pilot, right, you get trained in what's called VFR, right? Which is you can fly during the daytime, you can't fly at night, and you can only fly in good weather where there's good visibility because you don't know how to go or fly the plane based on instruments. And then the second rating, which is the hardest, is what they call IFR, which is instrument flight rules, which means even if you can't see, if it's pitch black, you can use the instruments and fly that plane and navigate blindly, safely to the location that you want to go. And you might be going, Matt, what does VFR and IFR have to do with fear and living life and faith? And for many of us, if I was very honest, and sometimes this is me, but I want to ask this question is this you? Are you trying to navigate life through VFR, visual flight rules only? You know, it'd be hard to make it through life if you can only go out on good days, if you can only go out when there's no storms, if you can only go out in the daytime, you are literally missing half of life if you can only go by the circumstances around you. What would it look like to live life based on the instrument, knowing that we are secure, that when faith blinds us, when feelings tell us we should do something else, that you and I can have an anchor of God's love. Listen, anyone that would die for you is for you. The tomb, the empty tomb is an instrument that we can look to that can navigate you and I, regardless of what we see and how we feel. And there's a question that leaves us asking, how do we get out of the fear cycle that it can become a reflex. And how do we make this love cycle become a reflex? And so I wanna give you three steps that any of us can take. And listen, these three steps, I could take six weeks on each steps in a sermon, but I literally have like three minutes to go over them. So I'm gonna go over them really quickly, okay? Here's step number one to move to a different reflex. Remind ourselves of who God is by reading the Bible. If we could just daily check in with the Bible. Listen, the world around us screams at us all day long. Your value comes from your beauty, your talent, your money, your success, your looks. Like it tells you, if you don't have those things, then you don't have value and your life isn't a success. But if we daily go and remind us that there's a God who loves us and is for us and has all these promises by reading the Bible. The second thing is we can reconnect with God's presence, the Holy Spirit in prayer. Listen, every day, listen, I bet most of you, why don't you just type in phone or cell phone, right? If you have a cell phone or a phone that you use, listen, by the end of the day, what do you do at night before you go to bed? You charge the battery up because because it's drained all the power getting used. We should daily reconnect with our power source, God's presence in prayer. And then thirdly, we can be reassured through worship, singing and gratitude. 
I mean, sometimes just making a gratitude list. I mean, the worship team led us in worship and it reminds us of God's goodness, not the good things that he gives us, but that he is good and that we can put our hope and trust in him. We can simply do these three things every day so that our reflex becomes one of love and not one of fear. And so if I had to sum up this message today, here's what I would say. I'm gonna put it up on the screen here. I would say God's love can free us from the slavery of a fearful mindset. You see, here's the truth. The feeling of fear, well, that's unavoidable. The truth is a fearful feelings isn't an if question. It is simply a when question. However, you and I can make a choice when we have the feeling of fear to experience and execute discipline. You and I on a daily basis can choose the input to do one or two things. Don't, don't miss this. We can either feed our fear or starve our fear. And so I would ask, maybe you want to type in in the chat, I'm going to starve my fear. I'm going to have some input that won't feed my fear, but that will starve my fear. I want to close with a true example about my daughter. Now, I have an older daughter and a younger daughter. And one of those daughters, um, when she was little, for whatever reason, uh, maybe just because she likes food or likes dinner or whatever, but even from a little age, she would ask mom or I almost every night, are we having dinner? Which was really confusing to me because we never did not feed her. Like every once in a while, we had like, you know, quesadilla night or like leftover night, but we never did not feed her dinner. But even from a little kid, all the way up through elementary school, even in the high school, she would come down every night and go, hey, mom, hey, dad, are we having dinner? Mom, are you making dinner? And finally, in her teens, when she asked this question one day, I go, hey, we've made dinner for you almost for two decades. Why do you keep asking it? And then they kind of went, I don't know why. And he, I know why, because they had a regular response that became a reflex. And it leaves me asking you and I this question as we look at the goodness of God's creation, as we look at the goodness of the things that God gives us in life that we can consume and enjoy, as we look at God's goodness in the cross and the empty tomb, I wonder how many of us daily come to God and go, are you really good? And it's not because we don't see God's good, it's because our reflex is an unhealthy mindset based in fear. And so I wanna leave us with a simple question. What will you choose as your daily input this week? Will you daily choose to input something that will feed your fear? Or will you daily input something that will starve your fear? Our hope and our prayer is that love will become the mindset and that fear will never drive you or I to an unhealthy or unwise decision because the quality of our life is determined by our decisions. And if we make them in fear, then it'll cause a life that none of us wants. So our hope and our prayer is that we would starve our fear, and not feed it. Let me pray for us. Hey God, thank you for loving us. God, thank you that you freed us from the slavery of fear. God, that your love is true and good and that there is nothing, your scripture says, there is nothing in heaven, on earth or below earth. There's no circumstances that can separate us from the love of God found in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would pour out your spirit, God, upon our hearts and our minds, God, so that we can trust in you, so that the decisions that we make would not be fearful decisions, but decisions that are sound, that are made in love. God, we just invite you in, God. We just say yes. We say we're gonna daily input is gonna be of, of prayer. Our daily input is gonna be of the scripture. Our daily input is gonna be in worship, God, so that we don't make decisions based in fear. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said amen. Thanks for joining us this Sunday. Have a great one. By the way, happy Mother's Day to all the moms. God bless and have a great one.